State lost 23-20 to the Iowa Hawkeyes on Saturday in a top five matchup that featured a critical injury, actually several critical injuries for the Penn State Nittany Lions, but no one more so important than quarterback Sean Clifford, who left with just over 12 minutes left in the second quarter and did not return with an apparent upper body injury. His replacement, Taquan Roberson, went 7 of 21 for 34 yards throughout the rest of the game. And the question is today, with Penn State almost winning that game still, 23-20, why wasn't Taquan Roberson in the Penn State offense more prepared for a backup quarterback? Now, this is a really not fun topic to talk about, truthfully, because uh, there's a lot of stuff about practice in general. Uh, in college that we don't have access to, information that is only given to us through filtered sources. But there are a couple of things that we're going to go over today and uh, a couple of topics, a couple of themes, a couple of things that have made this particular situation come about. Uh, and it deals with practice time, it deals with the transfer portal, and it deals with the players that are involved in and the situation for Penn State football. So we'll dive into maybe some of the reasons why Taquan Roberson was not ready for prime time. Part of that, and part of what I get into about why the particular game plan on Saturday did not fit his skills, is in my film study. BWI.Rivals.com, BlueWhiteIllustrated.com, if you want to check out that article. So, aside from those schematic issues, let's get into the larger picture and some of the broader topics in college football that are happening, you know, in the shifting landscape in modern football. The first has to deal with the actual amount of practice time that teams have been getting. A, a lot of reading is going to be happening today because a lot of this is uh, work that is done by great journalists, national and local, about how practices are now conducted. In the last year, the NCAA adopted a new practice model that severely limited the time of padded practices that players can go through, along with scrimmages and other times that they can uh, simulate live activity. Now, here is how it went down over the last year, according to Barrett Solly and Dennis Dodd of CBS Sports on April 22nd. This is from their joint article. The recommendations include reduced full padded practice from 21 to 8 practices, limiting each team to 2 full scrimmages. Goes on to say legislation would formalize what is largely occurring in FBS football, including and relating to ongoing player safety movement. Injury statistics have long proved that most injuries, especially brain trauma, occur during practices. This has been a trend in college football and the NFL over the last decade to reduce brain injuries, make football safer, and to help players manage those situations over time. Uh, again, in 2016, the NCAA recommended only one full padded practice per week during the season. So if we're talking about the amount of available practice time for coaches to instruct players and quarterbacks, not just in the schematics, not just in the throwing of at practice, which, by the way, what we do get to observe, Taquan Roberson, Christian Veyu, uh, Sean Clifford, they all get individual instruction from Mike Yursich. It's not like it's only Clifford. We see them each being worked with with the quarterback. They're standing there hearing the exact same information from Yursich at practice. So what does that mean when it comes to the actual live simulation of games? It means that there's less, and there's been less and less, especially this season. This is from Ralph Russo in the AP May 5th. Uh, Lions referred to the model as the 988 method. Eight days of player practice in helmets and shoulder pads, no live tackling to the ground, nine days, just helmets, no more than eight days of full contact during training camp. Now, a lot of this does have to do with the offensive line, and this may answer some of your questions about why Penn State doesn't run block as well, but also every team is in this situation, and some run block better than others. Uh, the current proposal would limit a full contact practice to no more than two consecutive days. Now, this from Ross Dellinger, this is a little more lengthy, at SI.com. 
Uh, this is a quote in his article from West Virginia coach Neil Brown. I understand the oversight in the NCAA, what they're shooting for to make our game safer. Safer. I don't think you'll find a single coach against making it safer. The one aspect we have to keep in mind is, are we preparing the guys enough in this model for games? Uh, oversight subgroup meeting Wednesday afternoon during this article. Uh, expected to finalize the modifications. Here is how many practices you get in training camp now. 25 practices over the same amount of days, 29, they can hold, uh, but it limits the contact of full padded practices from 90 minutes to as few as 45. So not only are you getting fewer practices in pads, you're getting fewer minutes in practice with pads. So 25 practices, only eight in pads for 45 minutes. Now, again, this is all about player safety. 72%, again, this is according to the Ross Dellinger's article, 72% of concussions occur during practice. 50% happen in preseason practice, despite it being one-fifth of the season. So this is done to keep players safe. But it does limit the ability to prepare players to play football. As much as you want to go routes on air, shells, things like that, there are certain aspects of the game, certain in-game situations of the bullets are really flying now that I don't think, based on what we saw on Saturday, Taquan Roberson had been prepared for because the number of those reps are super limited. And it's something that uh, Mike Yurcich talked about when it comes to just simply the deep passing game for Penn State earlier this week when he was talking with reporters before the game. It's not just about, hey, this is a deep ball, go man run. There's a lot of technique to it. Um, and I think the most critical thing about that is, is how do you practice the deep ball? Because if you think about it, these guys have to go run, I don't, I don't know how many plays, uh, 30 plays on Tuesday, full speed, how many deep shots are you going to take? If you take three deep shots, man, you have to get the scout team to give the right look. Um, the protection has to be right. Um, if it's a bad snap, that's a bummer because those reps, you're probably only going to get those three reps all week. So they're so precious. Now, going back to our uh, Ross Dellinger at ESPN article, new policies mean more than one third of camp will be non-contact practices. This is less time for to train players to compete in live games against Power 5 programs with advanced athletes. I mean, that makes sense, right? You have less time to prepare, so you're going to prepare the players that need to be prepared. On top of that, this is a conversation we've been talking about since the very beginning of spring football. Can Sean Clifford be ready to operate the Penn State offense in less than a year under new offensive coordinator Mike Yersich? If this is year two for Taquan Roberson in the program, is he ready in that situation? Because it's year one and they are... I'm assuming plowing every valuable practice rep, the first 45 minutes of those padded practices, into Sean Clifford to get him ready to help a team be 5-0 and and in that situation to begin with against two top 25 teams to start the season? Is that a reasonable expectation to then have the backup quarterback ready to play? That's an open question. Is it reasonable? Should they have found another way? Is there another way? This is what Mike Yersich had to say about uh, developing the backup quarterbacks and what he's seen from them. This comes from Media Day in August. You know, you know, over the summer, there's only so many, you know, you can't really watch them throw the football at all. So, you know, this will be a big fall camp for them. Growth-wise, we saw a, a big increase uh, from practice one to practice 15 through the spring game. And so we need to con con continue to see that uh, that growth. But the maturity is there on both the young men. And then, of course, there's the player himself, Taquan Roberson. Uh, again, we're going to go back to Mike Yersich and his comments about what it is to develop a quarterback, not only the time that it takes for that player of individual instruction or to be in those reps with the first team unit, but also how long that individual player's clock goes before the light switches on, as he says. And I'm not big into putting any labels on guys because I've seen guys change dramatically um, over the course of, you know, some guys it's different. Some guys it's the initial six months. Some guys it's 12 months. Some guys that second year it clicks. 
Um, I think if you try to put a guy on a shelf and you put a label on him, um, you got to coach them all and try to bring out their best uh, attributes and try to make sure that you're, you're trying to optimize um, their ability to make plays and to do what they do best and to help them be tougher, to help them be better thinkers, um, clearer thinkers. I think those are all the challenges from each quarterback that plays the game of football. And then, of course, we come to the star ranking. Taquan Roberson, a four-star athlete coming out of New Jersey in the class of 2019. Why is a four-star quarterback not ready for primetime? Why is he so underdeveloped why is he not able to make these plays and these reads uh why was trace mcsorley a three-star quarterback that was overdeveloped why was tommy stevens a superior athlete that was not able to beat out mcsorley or go make it work at mississippi state this is a circular conversation it's almost like uh i don't know a one to five ranking of thousands of high school football players with thousands of different variables maybe doesn't provide enough context to really give you a full picture of that player's strengths and weaknesses. Maybe this is why T. Frank's film room is uh, a thing. Maybe that was a shameless plug for my own product here on our YouTube channel, which you should absolutely subscribe to so you don't miss any of this information about Penn State athletes when they commit to the Nittany Lions, and you can know going forward Maybe what the next quarterback looks like. Definitely a shameless plug. But it really, that's what it's about, is was Taquan Roberson, his ability to play at that level, a guarantee because of a four-star rating? It Ratings can mean a bunch of different things, from athletic ability to actual production to just size. Some players are uh, big, strong, physical athletes that just project well to the college level, but we don't really know what their development curve from a technical, positional uh, situation is going to be like. So there are a thousand variables that go into that. Uh, and really, the answer to the question of why wasn't Taquan Roberson ready, it can be one of these things or a number of these things. But let's go over one final thing before we ask another broad question about this particular topic. Um, the in-game performance of the offensive line and Roberson. Again, this unit has been working with Sean Clifford the entire spring, the entire training camp, and the entire regular season. This has been something that I think has been impressive so far from Mike Yersich's offense is that they have not made procedural penalties. There have not been a lot of false starts. There have been uh, not a ton of uh, misalignments, although there was one in the Indiana game that cost a touchdown. But those have been at a minimum, especially the false starts. That offensive line in particular was clearly used to Sean Clifford's cadence. The way he uh, calls out the play, the way he makes checks at the line, the way he sets the protections, the way he is about the snap before the snap, even down to the clap. That's the thing is, as much as the Iowa fans were causing uh, an exacerbation of a problem that was there, the problem was the Penn State offensive line wasn't used to hearing Taquan Roberson's voice or his cadence. And that was exacerbated by the crowd, and that's a situation that has not happened, even in the previous, even even in the previous part of the game. It wasn't like when Sean Clifford was under center, they were false starting five times in a row. So literally the circumstance, and again, if you want to see what the game plan was and how Taquan Roberson fit into that, you can go check out my film study of how very different a fifth-year quarterback and his game plan would be from a guy making his first collegiate start against that Iowa defense in particular. It's night and day what you would design if you're Mike Yersich. And then finally, let's ask and let's point out the obvious part of this that everyone made a comment of as they saw Will Levis go to, you know, 6-0 and on the season. The Kentucky Wildcats are now uh, 11th in the AP poll. It would be great for Penn State and for Penn State football fans if Will Levis was ready to step in and uh, make plays against the Iowa Hawkeyes. Would there be still similar situations of getting him ready to this new offense? Would there still be similar situations of practice time? Yes, there absolutely would be. But he is a guy that has proven that he can at least step on the football field and make yardage for a football team.
as he uh, demonstrated last year. And as he's demonstrated this year, 1,100 yards passing, 11 touchdowns, some up and down stuff. He's thrown almost as many interceptions as touchdowns. But Will Levis is, is an undefeated quarterback at this point in the season for Kentucky. So let's ask the question in a broader picture about the transfer portal. Is it good for college football in general? Because in previous years, Will Levis would be on the Penn State bench. He wouldn't be playing. Kentucky wouldn't have this quasi-magical season, the start to the season where they beat Florida this year. That's great for Kentucky. That's great for college football in general. Is it good for the teams that are just outside of the elite that can't hold on to uh, multiple good players at a certain position? Micah Bowens transferred because he didn't like the program and didn't like the situation with Mike Yersich for whatever reason and is now at Oklahoma. Would be another guy in this conversation, a, 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 I think a gifted passer when it comes to his uh, some of his tools that are now, again, at Oklahoma. Would he have been the backup quarterback? Would he have been ready? He certainly has a similar skill set to that of Sean Clifford. So outside of if you are an, a Penn State fan, I'm just asking an open question that this is what the transfer transfer portal brings to college football, especially at the most important position. Is that a good thing in general, or is that a bad thing in specific situations as you see here? So those are really the reasons why Taquan Roberson may or may not have been good uh, on Saturday. So pick your favorite. Or you can be in the camp that says there's not an excuse and that if you are a college football player and you're a coach that makes millions of dollars, your players should be ready to play. I don't really have a good answer for you. I just have some reasons why that might be. That's the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Again, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the content we have here on our YouTube channel. Blue White Illustrated on YouTube and, of course, wherever you get your podcasts.